Welcome to lesson number five from the Jewish Law School. And we'll start with Sheila. If you'd like to read the introduction here from this class that you see on the screen. Which no. leads us to a new question. If everyone is obligated to behave in the same way, doesn't that stamp out our individuality? Is there room for, and for my unique personality in one size fits all Judaism? Okay, so let's hear your thoughts just quickly momentarily. Uh, Carol Ann and Sheila, if you'd like to share, what do you think would be the answer? Is there room for individuality in a Judaism that has a one size fits all? Yeah, I, I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay, and just off the top of your head, could you think of a, a way that you think Judaism allows one to express their individuality? Well, I mean, like you're supposed to keep Shabbos, but you're allowed to do different things at different times or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Carol Ann? Oh, sorry. Yeah, would you I, want I, yeah I, I, think, I think so. I think that um, if you, you know, by following Torah and the, in the, in the law and, you know, you, uh, you, you can be, you can still be a, like a unique individual, but it's, um, but we, it's, we're not, it's not about we're not the most important thing it's there's you know there's um we we have to we have to be obedient mm -hmm. okay which is exactly what this class is going to be going through so let's start with it's divided into three sections let's start with section number one and carol if you'd like to read the screen section one read the sources and big idea uh, the sources are clear. Individualism is ideal. The big idea. Number one, the sources are clear. Individualism is ideal. While Jewish law is somewhat a standard, one size fits all, traditional Jewish sources make it clear that Judaism does not seek to squash our individuality and uniqueness. The big idea is more of a statement of fact rather than an explanation thereof. Very good. So our first thing is we're setting down the Jewish sources that show that there is individualism. And let's start with text number one, which this is from the Medrash, the commentary on the book of Bamidbar, the book of Numbers. So Sheila, if you'd like to read from, starting from the header, does Judaism, and then read text one. Oh. Oh, the first thing we must establish is that in traditional sources, Judaism absolutely celebrates diversity. Take a look at the following Midras. There is a law that upon seeing a large population of people, one should recite the following blessing. Blessed are you, Lord, our our God, master of the world, the knower of secrets. Just as their faces are different from each other, so too their minds and thoughts are different. Each person has his own thoughts. Okay. So we see over here that there's a special blessing when we see many people. What's the blessing? That we're praising God, that he knows the secrets of so many different people because everyone thinks differently. Now, why... Do we make a blessing upon seeing so many people together? Because each and every person is unique. Everybody is different in their thoughts. Yes, we're all human. And yes, there are common denominators. None of us are different in the sense that no one has two heads and no one has three eyes. But within each and every person, we all have our own cognitive style, our own personality. Everybody has a different background. And it demonstrates the diversity that there is in creation. So we see it just in the way God created us, that on the one hand, we're all the same. And on another aspect, we're all different. No two people are completely alike. So too in his Judaism, if we just take a simple example from the way he created us, so too in his Judaism, he wants, on the one hand, there is a Torah that's the same for everybody. And on the other hand, there's a uniqueness that every person finds within the religion. And let's see it more in detail over here in text number two. 
Uh, Carol, if you'd like to read text number two. Um, Rabbi Avram Yitzhak Hakov, Hakoven, yeah, Hakoven, Kuk and Aya Brachot Noach too. As we deepen our understanding and contemplate the unique nature of each person, we will be increasingly more and more amazed regarding the great differences that exist between people. These differences stem from God's wisdom. If all people were the same in their mindset and spirit, the world would be missing opinion, directions, and thoughts that are diverse and fruitful. Very good. So it's not just random, but it's intentional. Just as God is so diverse and God has so many ways that he can express himself and so many different opinions, so too when we see different individuals, there aren't those that are correct and those that are mistakes. Each and every individual, the way they're created is intentionally that way, corresponding to God's many facets, God's many ways of expressing himself. <clears throat> Let's see over here, just a short clip that brings out this point in a more modern day term, and we'll discuss in a moment how to compare that. So this is Judaism celebrating individuality, and the answer was unequivocal. Equivocally, yes. Let's see over here this little boy speaking about individuality. Okay, so this is just a short clip of his long lecture. The idea is he's trying to say he wants to be unique. He wants to be different, and therefore he has to do something different than everybody else does. Now, of course, we want to differentiate his individuality doesn't really stem in his own uniqueness. He's trying to bring it out in clothing, which clothing is a great complement to the one, the manufacturer, the one that made it, but it doesn't say much about himself. Which is why, to a certain degree, Judaism believes very much in women being modest, in men not having to stick out with the new fashion, but rather keeping a more simple type of clothing, because that allows not just to be an individual with the clothing that we wear, but it demands one to be individual in their own personality, in themselves. If you want to stick out and everybody's wearing the same clothing, you have to really be different in who you are, what type of person, what type of background, what type of emotions, what type of deep thoughts can you share that is unique and different. Let's read over here the next text that we have, yeah. a quote from the Talmud. Sheila, if you'd like to read, indeed, from indeed, and then text three. Oh, indeed, the Talmud tells us that the first human being was created alone for this very reason to demonstrate God's greatness, that though we all stem from the same single person, no two people are at all alike. Humans are, were created, shall we read that? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Humans were created alone to teach us that, the greatness of God, as when a person stamps several coins with one seal, they are all similar to each other, but the supreme king of cakes stamped all the people with it with the seal of Adam, the first man, as all of them are his offsprings and not one of them is similar to another. So again, we see over here God's greatness and it was intentional that God says, I could make everybody look exactly the same. I can make every human being be a copy of the next. However, God chooses not to. And God says, yes, 100%, it's important for me to have individuality to have individualism, to have everybody unique. No one should think of themselves as a copy of someone else, as extra props in God's society. Rather, each and every person is unique just for the way they are. So definitely, this is point number one. We're just bringing the sources. We're going to explain later in the class how each person is supposed to be unique. But this is just to prove that Judaism definitely believes that even though God gave Ten Commandments 
for all of the people. And then he gave us the Torah for all of the people. He didn't say, each one of you, I'm going to give a unique set of rules. However, he demands individuality. He created us. No better proof, the fact that he created us all thinking differently, looking differently. We speak differently. We have different sets of fingerprints. God went to great lengths in order to make us each and every one of us unique, different, and special. So let's read summary for point number one of the class. And Carol Ann, if you'd like to read that. Uh, we have covered the big idea number one. While Jewish law is somewhat a standard one size fits all, traditional Jewish sources make it clear that Judaism does not seek to squash our individuality and uniqueness. In the following section, we will explore big idea number two. Great. Okay, so before we get on to idea number two, let's just pull up over here. Just on this screen over here, we'll pull up. What would you say, Sheila, is Judaism a cookie cutter mold? Would you say that Judaism has a specific set and everybody just has to be part of that mold? No, no. The laws are, are, are a set, you know, like Jewish laws. But as far as like people could have different uh, professions, people have different colors, different tastes. Not everybody likes vanilla ice cream. Not everybody likes chocolate ice cream. Not everybody's an accountant. Right, right. Very you know, good. But the laws are the, you know. Very good. Okay. So let's go through over here and read in the second, the second part of the class. And Sheila, if you'd like to read individuality and intent. Now we're going to discuss how exactly is each person supposed to bring out their individuality if the laws are all the same. If everybody in the company was doing exactly the same thing, how do you bring out your uniqueness? When everyone performs the same mitzvah, individuality is expressed in the kavana, intention and mindset that a person has during the performance. Very good. So the word kavana is an oh, ancient sorry. word. Yeah, no, no, you, it's okay. Oh, my it's, accent is terrible, sorry. Whenever, whenever it's written in English, so it's difficult. So don't worry. <laughs> so so it's worse that when it's word, written in Hebrew. <laughs> yeah. So that word, which translates as intention and mindset, or in modern day terms, we would call it meditation. Kavana is not just to say the words, but to actually meditate on them. God, when he tells us to pray, he doesn't just want us to do lip service as if we're saying some password and it doesn't make a difference what we're thinking, but extremely important in our commandments and in our expression of connecting to God is our intent. What are we thinking? What are we, what's our mindset at that time? And this is really where individuality is allowed to and encouraged to flourish. This is really where we can express ourselves. Let's start over here with bringing a great example straight from the Torah, which is something that many people have a question. Let's start with reading this quote from the Torah. Caroline, if you'd like to read. Uh, the, the Torah describes how after the Mishkan was up and running, each one of the 12 Nislam heads of each tribe brought gifts. The one who brought his offering on the first day was Nashon, the son of Anabidadad of the tribe of Judah. And his offering was one silver bowl weighing, weighing 130 shekels, one silver sprinkling base, basin weighing 70 shekels. According to the holy shekel, both filled with fine flour mixed with olive oil for meal offering. One spoon weighing 10 shekels of gold filled with incense. The young bull, one ram and one lamb in his first year for a burnt offering. And for the peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs in their first year. This was the offering of Nishon, the son of Anabinadad. On the second day, Nathanel, the son of Zuhar, the chieftain of Issachar, brought his offering. 
he brought his offering of one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels, one silver sprinkling basin weighing 70 shekels according to the holy shekel, both filled with flour mixed with olive oil for a meal offering, one spoon weighing 10 shekels of gold filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, one lamb in its first year for a burnt offering, one young he goat for a sin offering, and the, and the peace yeah. offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs in their first year. This was the offering of Nathanael, the son of Zuhar. Beautiful. So I want to point out over here, this is the Torah itself. This is from the book of Numbers. We had over here, this first paragraph says, who brought the sacrifice on the first day of inauguration of the Mishkan, the temporary temple? So it says his name, and then it gives us a list of what he brought. So I'm going to highlight the entire paragraph which in the Torah, it tells us a list of everything, every single animal, every type of dish that he brought, how much it weighed, what was inside the dish. It goes into detail. Then it says on the second day of the inauguration, his friend, another chieftain of another tribe, brought an offering too. And guess what? The paragraph I just highlighted, the Torah repeats it completely again, word for word, and this entire paragraph that I'm highlighting again is written in the Torah separately, and it has the same exact sacrifice that his friend brought the day for, before. So you have not just two days, but the Torah goes on. We didn't quote it over here in the class, but this is just to give you the idea. The Torah quotes this 12 times, one after another, and each time it says exactly the entire offering that was brought. And the obvious question everybody would ask is, why does the Torah have to say it 12 times? Say it once, tell us exactly what he brought, and say, and the next 11 days, his friends brought the same thing, and yet the Torah doesn't do that. The Torah says each and every day, on day one, he brought as if this is a novelty. The second day, it says the same exact sacrifice, but because his friend brought it, the Torah says it again, and then a third time, and a fourth time. Why is the Torah expressing itself so many times seemingly in vain the torah is god's wisdom there's so many intricate details so many great lessons we learn from the torah these verses seem like it's a waste because it's just a copy paste and here we'll have this question of course this would be the obvious question someone would ask when they read that chapter did the nasim nasim are the chieftains the one in charge of the tribes the leaders of the tribe did they copy each other? And why does the Torah repeat the list 12 times? The Torah could have just said it once. Oh, I know. And the, answer, and the answer is exactly this point. This beauty of what we're trying to bring out. If the Torah said what the first guy brought, and then it said, copy pasted 12 times, 12 tribes, we're not important the details, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That would show that the individualism is not important. As if, God just needed the sacrifice. The fact that the other 11 people brought it, okay, it's beautiful, it's nice, no problem, you were just copying what someone else did. God spends that time and he writes down in the verses what each and every one of them brought to teach us this great lesson that there is no copy-paste. Even if your sacrifice is exactly the same like someone else, if you thought of it on your own, if this is something that you wanted to bring, that makes it so unique. That makes it special. That makes it that as if it's a brand new thing. In God's eyes, it doesn't matter if a million people did the same thing that you did. When you do it with your intention, with your mindset, with your background, with your courage to want to come ahead and bring a sacrifice for God, in God's eyes, that's a brand new first time ever had type of gift that he's receiving. God does not look at any individual's act as if he's just repeating what everybody else did, which is a great lesson for each and every one of us. Don't ever think that when we do a commandment, oh, we're just one of the millions of Jews that are doing it, doesn't make a difference. In God's eyes, when you do it, it's as if no one else has ever done it before because no one else is like you. No one else had all the same challenges, trials, gifts, talents, 
and turbulations as much as you had. And no one else is the same year or stage of life as you are. So when you do it, it is brand new in God's eyes. That is the beautiful lesson that God finds it worthy of repeating these verses 12 times. So as we have it over here, so the list continues to tell us this great lesson. Let's read it from Nachmanides inside. And Eliyah, if you'd like to read over here, he explains this point. Text number five. There's another explanation of this chapter in the interpretations of the rabbis. Namely, that each of the chieftains intended to bring it a dedication offering to the altar, which would be of the amount specified in the verses, but Nachshon, prince of the tribe of Judah, had a particular reason for bringing this number of offerings. And each of the other princes thought of an independent reason. Very good. So if each and every person is doing it for their own reason, even if it's exactly the same, that makes it unique in God's eyes. And that's why God repeats it. So, so too with each and every one of us, we're doing something. We celebrate Passover. We're not just another one of the millions of people, millions of people celebrating Passover. When we celebrate it, we had our own reason why we came to it, our own connection to God that we were looking for. In God's eyes, we're like the one and only guy doing it. Let's just see over here an interesting short clip that brings out this point of the uniqueness of a gift, even though it might be a copy paste. So what do we see in this video that it might have been the same exact thing, but each one feels that because the gift was done, each one had their own reasoning as to why they want to bring it. That makes it special. That makes it. It's not just I went and I bought myself a phone. I bought a phone for someone else. I gave him a gift. He might have given me the same thing, but we weren't copy pasting each other. We're not just doing the same thing. We each had our own background that led us to decide to bring this gift. And let's read. This text, which explains it a little deeper, uh, Sheila, if you'd like to read text number six. A, a Jew may feel that his effort to serve God and to get, create a relationship with God is not significant in the eyes of God. After all, there are so many other Jews practicing the same mitzvah. One may wonder about what value there is in his listening to the sound of the shofar, eating matzah on Passover, or lighting shofar. Shabbat candles when there are millions of other people doing the same thing. The repetition of the specifics of each of the identical offering teach, teaches us a profound lesson to God. No two offerings are the same. While two people may do the same deed, the intention, the emotion, the struggle is unique to each person. While the leaders wanted to offer their offerings on the day of inaug inauguration, 
God told Moses that each leader should offer his offering on his own day because to God, every offering, every action is unique. You are unique. No other person does the mitzvah with the identical intention as you do. No other person experiences life exactly the way you do. Your contribution, your offering is of critical uh, is of crucial importance in the eyes of God. The Torah reminds you that no one can offer the universe what you can. Exactly. Beautiful. Okay. So now the question, let me ask you, if I tell you, going each, asking each one of you, say it with flowers, what would come to your mind? Don't say whatever or anybody else said. So starting with Eliyaf, I say, say it with flowers. Think of an idea that you're trying to say over that you need flowers. Um, okay. Does this relate to the video? Because I couldn't hear no. the video. Oh, sorry. Was no one able to hear the video? I couldn't hear it either. I typed uh -oh. it in the chat, but I didn't, I think maybe you didn't see it. I should have said it out loud. Oh, sorry. I apologize about that. I'm not sure um, what happened over there. Okay, so I guess we'll skip the video for now. But no, it's not related to the video. Um, were you able to see the video, just not hear it? Well, you could see it. Like, yeah. You could figure it out. Okay, so sorry. Basically, the video was each one decided to buy a gift for their friend. And it turns out they each bought exactly the same gift for one another. But it shows on, they don't consider it that, oh, I just bought myself a phone. He considers that I bought him, my friend, a phone, and he bought it to me because we each had a different reason for buying it for our friend. So too, when it comes to our connection to God, when we're doing something, even if it's exactly what someone else did, it's for our own reason. But I guess we'll skip the video for now. But this one is a question not related specifically to the video. But I'll give you here, I'll pull up on the screen some ideas. If I say, say it with flowers, can you think of ideas that could be said with flowers? Uh, like, I'm sorry, I love you. Um, Very good. Um, right. Um, welcome. Um, just yep. for no reason at all, just thinking of you. Right. It could be decor for Shabbat. It could be for showing condolences for someone's passing. It could be for planting, friendship, romance. These are all ideas that could be said with the same thing, flowers. What this shows us is that the same action can have completely different meanings. It's all flowers, but the way it's given, who gives it, when he gives it, the expression that he does it, makes all the difference. So too, when it comes with God's commandments, I could say, what do you mean? It's the same commandments, the same flowers, but the same flowers can be done so differently in so many different circumstances. And that changes everything. So too, with our intent, the way we do the commandment, that's really where our uniqueness is brought out. Let's read the next text, which explains this <laughs> and start with Jewish law. Eliaf, you'd like to read starting with from the top and then text seven. Jewish law asserts that there should be uniformity in action, but diversity regarding the inner world of intentions, emotions, and spirituality. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs develops his dialect and describes the beauty and wisdom of his dual approach. The context of his remarks are on a passage from Talmud, which states that when God asked the Jewish people if they would accept the Torah, they responded, Na se venishma, we will do and we will understand says Rabbi Sachs. Um, at the level of Nase and Jewish deed, we are one. To be sure there are differences. Oh, to be sure there are differences. In every generation, there are disagreements between leading the scheme, halachic authorities. That is true in every legal system. Poor is the Supreme Court that leaves no space for dissenting opinions. Ashkenazim and Sephardim differ too, yet these differences are insignificant in comparison with the agreed fundamentals of halacha. This is what has historically united the Jewish people. Judaism is a legal system. It is a code of behavior. It is a community of deed. That is where we require consensus. 
Hence, when it comes to doing not doing not said, the Israelites spoke together and with one voice. Despite the differences between Halal and Shammai, Abaye and Rava, Rambam and Rosh, Rosh R. Yosef Karo, and R. Moshe Esorelis, Esorelis, we are bound together by the choreography of the Jewish deed. Of the Jewish deed. At the level of Nishma, understanding, however, we are not on to be one, or not on to be one. Judaism has had its rational, rationalists and its mystics, mysticists, mystics, its philosophers and poets, scholars whose minds were firmly fixed on earth and saints whose souls soar to heaven. What unites Jews, what should unite us is action and not reflection. We do the same deeds, but we may understand them differently. There can be an agreement on the nase, but not the nishma. We should allow people great leeway in how they understand the faith of our ancestors. We will do and we will understand means we will do in the same way we will understand in our own ways. Way. I believe that action unites us, leaving us space to find our own way to faith. Very good. So we have, I think he brings it up beautifully, how Judaism requires both. On the one hand, we all perform the commandments the same. One cannot say, well, God says to celebrate Shabbat on Saturday. I have my own way of celebrating Shabbat and I do it on Sunday. Everybody would agree that that's not part of what the way God wants it to be done. But when it comes to the Nishma, how one does it, meaning the intent that's involved with the philosophy behind, with the intent, with the emotions, that is where we're all unique. That is where we can differ, but we won't differ on the fundamentals of what Judaism is requiring. Well, let's read it over here. This is a quote from the first Chabad Rebbe. He explains this in more emotional terms. And let's have Sheila, if you'd like to read this. Um, on a more spiritual level, individuality in mitzvah is a very real thing. For while actions may all look the same, the spiritual intent and the energy on individual injects into his or her performances is completely unique in, to the individual and to the individual, to that individual, in the text below, the first Kabad Rebbe, Rabbi Shneer Zalman of Laudi, speaks of different levels of love for God a person can achieve when doing a particular mitzvah. Read the, should you read the next one? Yeah, yes, please read text eight. Okay. Each of the, each of this said two, two levels of love. The great love and the eternal love is subdivided into many shades and gradation, gradations without limit. And each individual, according to his or, or her capacity, as is written in the Holy Zohar uh, on the verse, her husband is known in the gates. This refers to God who makes himself known and attaches himself to every one according to the extent which one measures in one's heart. Therefore, fear and love are called the secret things known to God, while the Torah and the commandments are those things which are re re revealed, revealed into us and to our children to do. For we have all one Torah and one law, insofar as the fulfillment in all Torah and commandments in actual performance is concerned. It is different. Uh, it, it is different with fear and love, which, which vary according to the knowledge of God in the mind and heart. Very good. So in short, what he's explaining here is there's a verse in the Torah that says that the revealed is for us and the concealed is for God. Meaning God is saying that what's revealed to you, that is something that I hold you accountable for. What is concealed to you, I don't hold you accountable. So on a mystical level, he explains it that what's revealed is performing the acts, that is for us. But what is concealed, meaning the level of connection and devotion that one feels to God, the love, the awe, the desire that one has to connect to God, that is unique and different, each one according to their background, according to how much they appreciate, they understand God, how much they are committed to God, and that would make the differentiation as to how much they're feeling their connection to God. 
So if we were to ask the question like we have here on the screen, uniformity is only in the world of, and Carolina, I'd like to ask you, is it in intentions, emotions, spirituality, or action? Only one of these are correct. Uniformity. I would say intentions. Well. So we just, so to focus on specifically the action is the correct one. Action uh -huh. meaning that we're, we are we all the same, specifically in how we do it, meaning the greatest rabbi and a Jew that just found out he's Jewish, right, both eat right. the matzah the same way. They both take a piece of matzah, they chew it in their mouth and they eat it. The intentions they have, the emotions, spirituality, what they're feeling at the time, that is where God wants us to be unique. But the action is only place where we're all the same. Every Jew cele celebrates each mitzvah the same way. There's no like, if you're a well-versed Jew that feels connected to spirituality, you should celebrate it this way. And if you're a Jew that doesn't feel so much intention or emotions, then celebrate it by doing another action. The action is where it's all the same. Everything beyond that is where the uniqueness is. And let's read this, Caroline, if you'd like to read this paragraph and text number nine. All right. Every person possesses a unique soul charged with a unique mission on earth. It follows then that no two people accomplish the same cosmic, cosmic effect with the actions they do, regardless of the choreography of these actions are exactly alike. The Rebbe presents this idea in simple language. The Labachip, the Labachip, Right. You can skip, skip the header. Rabbi Hayom Yom Entre for Nissan 25. The individual service to God must be commensurate with his character and innate qualities. There may be one who can drill pearls or polish gems, but works at baking bread. The analogy in the realm of the Avodah may be easily understood. Although bread, baking bread is the most necessary craft in occupation, this person is considered to have committed a sin. So in simple English, what he's saying is, yes, everybody can do certain things. However, we're each unique, meaning God gives us certain gifts and qualities. And for us to compare ourselves to another and say, we're all the same. And therefore, if he can do it, I can do it. I should be doing what he's doing. Might be wasting a great talent on something simple. So if NASA scientists, which are working on rockets, decide that, you know what? I could stock shelves in Walmart. Why should I sit here and be a scientist if I can stock shelves? The answer is yes, stocking shelves in Walmart is extremely important. And without that, the scientists will all starve to death. We need people that work throughout the chain. But one has to realize where are my gifts and talents? And I must use the uniqueness that God has gifted me. And that is the way I can serve God. If I don't use out my talents fully, I'm committing a sin to a certain degree. Meaning if you are really bright and you don't use your brain, that is wasting a gift from God. If someone is really good at speaking and they don't use out that gift for enhancing people to serve God, to do good things, that's a gift being wasted. If one is really talented in any field, one has a gift, which everyone does have something that you're unique at, that is where they must focus their action. So yes, overall, all action is important, but there is uniqueness as well. And one has to, Pay attention to where they feel they have a greatness, whether it's being kind, being happy, encouraging people, smiling to people, and everyone has something that is where they're expected to show up at their greatest power. And Elia, if you'd like to read the next section. Um, a two-tiered identity individual and collective all this talk about individuality is not to detract from the notion of a community a collective jewish identity both are true judaism cheers each one of our individual identities and at the same time we have the privilege of another factor another layer to our identity that is part of a collective 
Prayer in Judaism is a perfect example. Many are troubled by the fact that prayer, a spiritual practice which should be highly individualized, is not at all individual. Rather, everyone recites the same exact text. How can I feel anything personal in my prayer if it's a standard text that thousands of others recite as well? The prayer of a community ascends to God that he is crowned with it. Oh, and he is crowned with it. Because it, compromise, it, it comprises many hues and intentions from which it, has made into a, which it is made into a crown to be placed on the head of God. The prayer of an individual, however, is not many-sided and presents only one hue. Hence, it is incomplete and not at all acceptable as the prayer of a, a congregation. Very good. So to explain what you just read is giving an example in Judaism where we have individualism and collective. Prayer is something that every person is unique. And even though, like you asked this question right in the beginning, how can one feel personal in my prayer if I'm reading a standard text? Then every Jew is reading the same text. And the answer is, where is your uniqueness? In the intention that you have. The thoughts that you put in to the words that you say, that's where your uniqueness is. It used to be, actually, that there was no standard text prayer. The only reason why it was instituted at later stage is because the rabbis realized that many people had no idea what to say when they came time to pray. They couldn't speak one language properly. They didn't know how to express themselves properly. So the rabbi said, let's make a standard text. But at no point did they mean that everybody has the same request that they want to make from God. They said, on the contrary, think about what it is that you want to connect with God during your prayer because everyone is unique. So they're just giving you a base how to start, but you have to do it your own way. It's like a car that you drive. The manufacturer makes millions of cars or thousands of cars exactly the same like yours, but give it a little bit of time and your car will look nothing like any other car, even that ones that were copies at the time that it was created, because your unique way of driving your car, the mess that you leave inside, the amount of oil changes that you do and the gas and the tire pressure and the dents and the scratches and, and the spills that you had inside, all this is your uniqueness within a system of everybody having the same thing. But specifically when it comes to prayer, we don't just want everybody's own prayer. There's a two-prong approach. We need both the individual because you have your own intentions, your own feelings, your own personal requests that you put in. And then there is praying together with others has the beauty of multiple colors. It has the beauty of a beautiful piece of music that's not just from one instrument, but many instruments together. So to sum up this section, it's about having the individualism together with the community. Having both together is really the beautiful gift that we have. So we have over here another video. You just have many different types of shoppers, those all different personalities. So everybody's shopping in the store, but you have all the different types of guys. Some people, like you see over here, the guy that runs back to get one more thing. He always just remembers at the counter that he needs to get one more thing. You have the guy that is still in a shopping cart even when he's 70 years old. You have the guy that forgets where he parked and he walks around the whole parking lot clicking his clicker. And so on, the guy that's eating snacks while he walks around in the store, the guy that blocks the aisle while he's shopping. It's to show that everybody's shopping, but everybody's unique in the way they shop. So it's a little <laughs> bit of a humorous type of video to bring out that point. But the lesson in this second, second section is God intentionally created everyone different. So look at differences that you have and never look at them as a fault. Look at them as God is setting you up with exactly the right tools that you need in order to fulfill your mission. I think a beautiful example is they say that the bird, when it was created, was really small and everybody was eating up the bird. All the animals that got hungry, they ran over to the bird and ate him, ate him up. So the birds that were left cried out to God and they said, God, what's going to happen with us? How are we going to protect ourselves? What are we going to do? So God says, you know what? I'm going to give you wings. This way you'll be able to protect yourself. So he gives them wings and the bird sits there and he complains to God. He said, God, I used to be weighing five pounds and I was able to run a little bit. Now you put on these heavy things on my sides. I weigh even more. I can't even run fast anymore. How exactly are you helping me 
with these wings. And God says, little bird, you don't understand. This is not to make you heavier. This is to make you lighter and allow you to soar high. Use these wings to fly. And the bird starts flapping the wings and he realizes that this was a beautiful gift that God gave him, that he can actually now go above ground and be in a whole different tier than all the other animals that are attacking it on the ground. So too in life, God gives us things and we can either look at it as bogging us down, something that's so heavy and so annoying that it's disturbing us from flowing, going high, running fast. Or we can say, you know what? God gave me something special, but it's for a reason. God created me differently because I have a unique mission. I have to fly. I'm not here to just walk around on the earth like everybody else. I have something in heaven that's meant specifically for me. I'll just show you the non-videos that we have here. So you have the same, same, but different. So we're all the same, but yet God intentionally wants us to all be different. We'll skip this clip. And I think this one is a little bit humorous that brings out this point. Always remember that you're unique, just like everyone else. And it's not to say that it's not true. It's to say that you are unique, but everybody is unique. Not that you're unique, but everybody else is the same. Everybody is unique in their own way. So we're the same in the sense that we're all unique. Let's take this as an example. If I were to tell you, make a checklist of what you would have on your Shabbat table. If you're celebrating Shabbat, one person would write down, you need a challah board, challah cover, challah knife, kiddush cup, candlesticks, dishes, recipes, flowers, tablecloths. Everybody has gefilte fish, their own unique way, their own unique style in how they're bringing out the same idea. So individualism does not have to be that we all have a unique law code. We don't all have to have a different book that we follow. We can all follow the same book, but our unique way of how we express ourselves within the general code, that's all the same for all. So let's read just the summary over here for point number two. And Elia, if you'd like to read the summary and then we'll move on to point number three. Well, everyone performs the same to vote individually is expressed in the covenant intention and mindset that a person has has during the performance on a spiritual level this makes the relationship with god that it formed through the mitzvah unique everyone connects to god on a different level in the following section we will explore big idea number three good okay so let's read number three and carol if you'd like to read over here uh number three individual expression in mitzvot on a spiritual level this makes the relationship with God that is formed through the mitzvah unique. Everyone connects to God on a different level. Very good. So now we explain just to recap point number one, saying that, yes, individualism is inherent, is important, is an essential point. Point number two was expressing it on a spiritual way. We all do the same commandments, but the intent is different. And now we're going to explain how even in the action, we can each bring out our individualism. And let's go through four different methods, how we each do the same action in a different way. So Sheila, if you'd like to read this page, so starting from so far and then text number 11. So far we have learned that our individuality has, this thing on it's passed in the intent we invest in our this for performance. Now we now we will learn that in in the style and substance of what we do, there are also many differences and in four particular details. One, do it with your own style. In the following passage, Rabbi Soloveitchik describes that even if two people perform the same exact myth for the religious style of each person is individualized. Should I read 11? Yes, please. Okay. Two, two, people, two people may sit at a Seder table and go through the same motions. If we should ask what they, what they are doing, the answer would be that they are both doing the Shlokht and Arak 
requires of them. However, if the question should shift from what they, they are doing to how they are doing it, if the question should be related not to the way of, do, of doing, but to the style in which they are doing it, the answer would be that they each does in, in his own characteristic individual, individual style. One lets, one lets joy manifest itself in song and dance. His performance is ecstatic one. The other celebrates the Seder with subdued happiness. He cannot express the joy which remains ar arrested within him. Another ce celebrant of the Seder may fulfill the mitzvah not with ecstasy, but with a sense of commitment and, oops, Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I'll highlight where you're holding right there. The surrender of the Almighty. There is one way of life, but there are a variety of styles of how to experience God while performing one duty. They that should that they should do, or one duty that they should do. This refers to going beyond the letter of the law. Each person in his own manner or style. Very good. So point number one is we all have our own style, how we can do the same commandment. One does it with singing and dancing. One does it in a more mellow way. This is how we can express our own personal experience, our own personal individuality within the commandment itself. Let's do point number two. Caroline, if you'd like to read it, beautifying. Beautifying how we make a mitzvah special. In addition to doing the mitzvah with personal style, there are also chances to enhance or beautify the mitzvah, a wide open door for personal touch as the Talmud states. As it was taught in the Baratica Barat, Barat, with regard to the verse, this is my God and I will glorify him, the Lord of, the Lord of my father and I will raise him up. The sages interpreted, Beautify yourself before him in mitzvot, even if one fulfills the mitzvah by performing it simply. It is nonetheless proper to perform the mitzvah as beautifully as possible. Make before him a beautiful sukkah, a beautiful lula, lua, a beautiful shofar, a beautiful ritual tzit, beautiful parchment for a Torah scroll. Very good. So the second point is how one does it with beautifying it. When one wants to show that they really enjoy something, they're really connected with something, they get a beautiful version of it. If someone really appreciates their phone, they get a new, nice, beautiful phone. When we do our commandments, we also, we can beautify it. Many have the custom of adorning, whether it's their sukkah, put an extra adornment on it. Or even just buying something nice, a nice lulav, a nice Torah, a nice tzitzit. These are all ways where one can bring out his individuality even within doing the same commandment like everyone else. Let's read over here point number three. And Elia, if you'd like to read the third way that in the action we can express our individuality. Expanding. How we add to a mitzvah. Another area where individuality is expressed is prayer. The formal text of prayer is a standard that we all keep, but ideally each person should also add in their own prayers. Um, if a person wishes to add to any of the middle blessings of Shemona Esrei, the Amidah, in a matter which, oh, in a matter which relates to that blessing, he may do so. What does this mean? If he knows a sick person, he should pray for mercy in Raphaenu, 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 the general blessing for health. Um, if he needs livelihood, he should request it in um, Barechaleinu, the general blessing for livelihood. In Shema Kuleinu, the final request for the Amidah, a person can make any request that relates to any other need. So again, we see over here, besides for the minimum mitzvah, where one can express an individuality is by adding. It's actually a mitzvah where one, while they pray the silent prayer, they should request anything that they want from God. 
try to connect it with the appropriate blessing, meaning the blessing that speaks about health, add in a personal request if you have a loved one that's sick, and so on throughout the blessing. So we see about how one should expand on the base. Don't make up your own commandment, but once one has done the minimum, they can there add on any specific request that they have. Just to bring out, this is connected with the previous point. If I were to ask you over here, the Torah says build a nice synagogue. What's the nicest synagogue? So you have over here five beautiful synagogues all over mostly Europe for some reason. I didn't put together this list. <laughs> but the question is, which one is the most beautiful? And the answer is they're all beautiful in their own way. Each builder here, each community was expressing what they thought was beautiful. And that's expressing their individuality within a commandment of building a synagogue. Mm. Back to the text. Let's see the fourth way. Caroline, if you'd like to read number four. Focusing on, uh, focusing how we prioritize our time for mitzvah. Another area which individuality can be practically expressed in the observance of Jewish law is the energy and focus that a person invests in a specific mitzvot. Talmud Tritakt tri Shabbat, Rav Yosef, said to Raz Yosef, son of Rabbah, with, with, with which mitzvah was your father extra vigilant? He said to him, with the mitzvah of Tazit. Very good. So we have over here that we're all obligated to do all the mitzvot. However, where does one put the extra time after they've done the minimum where do you, does one focus? And everyone can have a certain mitzvah, everybody has a certain good deed that they're really gravitating towards. For one person, it's charity. For another person, it's helping the sick. For another person, it's visiting uh, people that are ill, people that are in prison. For another, it could be praying to God. Another, it could be being appreciative of their parents. Each and every one has another category that they could express their individuality within the commandments. What is it that they have that extra drive with? Let's pull over, over here this on the screen over here. Here we gave 10 examples of basic commandments where one is focused on what is his mitzvah, whether it's mezuzah, Jewish books in the home. Some people will have many books or encourage others to have books. Caring for one another, loving a fellow Jew, being careful with kosher, with studying Torah, putting on tefillin, Shabbat candles, and so on. These are all areas where one can focus and say, yes, all the commandments are applicable to all, but this is something where it's unique and special for me. This is something where I find extra pride. Let's move on now to the summary of the class. We'll move on to summary over here of point number three, and then we'll move on to the final summary. So, Eliaf, you'd like to read over here, big idea number three. Okay. By the way, my my screen froze earlier, so I don't know if you. I just want to. Oh. Um, okay. I don't know if you were trying to call on me or something. We have covered big idea number three. In addition to the diversity and in intention, there are also some diversity in action. There are four details. One, there may be a difference in style. While one Jew may perform a given mitzvah joyfully, another might do it. Oh, while one Jew may perform a given mitzvah joyfully, another might do it solemnly. A Jew may physically, oh, what, what is it? Yeah. You may physically yeah, yeah. beautify a mitzvah. Okay, number three, many mitzvah allow for spontaneity and the adding of a personal touch over and above the required action, such as prayer. Number four, a person can gravitate towards a specific mitzvah and focus his or her primary energy on that mitzvah. Very good, very good. So that's point number three within the class. But in general, the idea of the class was individuality in Judaism. So let's go through now the key points. We'll pull it up over here on this part of the screen and we'll have each one of you read a point. We'll go through it. So let's start with Caroline, if you'd like to read point number one. Mitzvot are mostly standard. Everyone must do the same action. Very good. So this was the question that I asked you before. Yes, the, I know. 
right? Which the one area that we're all the same is the action. Everybody has the same law. God gave the same commandments yes. to every Jew. And yet, let's read Judaism. number two. Okay, Judaism celebrates diversity. Very good. So we explained that even though the action is all the same, there is diversity. And how is exactly what the class was there to explain. Elia, let's read point number three and four. Two identical meets vote may express very different ideas or feelings. So people can do the same thing, but have different intentions or different um, reasons. And for every Jew forms a unique and different relationship with God through mitzvot. So again, like people have different reasons for doing what they do and that affects your relationship with God. Right. Based on their knowledge that they have to God, their emotions that they have, this all will make a difference in how one is connecting with God. Meaning what's the reason that they do it? Some will do it because they makes them feel Jewish. Some makes them feel like they're getting back at the Nazis, other feel like it's bringing the Mashiach, other feels like they're connecting with their grandmother, some feel like they want to repay God for the gifts that he gave them. Everybody can have a different intention, and that is precisely what makes us unique, but the actions are all the same. Okay, Caroline, if you'd like to read five and six. Okay, the sameness of each mitzvah unites us, while the uniqueness of our intentions show our diversity. Six. The mitzvot gives us the power of the community, but also the power of the individual. Very good. So we said, on the one hand, we had the naseh and the nishma. We're going to do what God said, and that we're all the same. And then we're going to listen, which includes the intention, which includes our emotion. That is where each one of us have a different opinion. So let us not get confused when we see different opinions with rabbis and in the Shulchan Aruch and throughout the stages of Judaism, there were always many different opinions in details, never about the essentials, but in the details, how to do it, that is not a problem, that is intentional. That was part of the process that the overall picture is the same, but the details will bring out each person's uniqueness. And like we find with prayer, we have on the one hand, each one of us have our own prayers that we want to say to God, but we're also supposed to pray as a community together because it has the beauty of the diversity. So you need the unity and the diversity simultaneously. Elia, if you'd like to read seven and eight. The way a mitzvah can be done also leaves room for diversity. And we can do a mitzvah in a unique style. So everybody, yeah, like I said before, kind of. Yeah, yeah, very good. So this was... Number one, not just in the intention, now we're getting into even in the action itself, one can do it in a joyous way, one can do it in a more solemn way, okay? And Caroline, if you'd like to read 9, 10, and 11, the last three points in the action, how one can do it differently. Okay, we can beautify a mitzvah. 10, we can add a personal touch to a certain mitzvot. 11, we can focus and place our energies in a specific mitzvot. Very good. So we can add a personal touch, like say something in addition in a certain aspect of a mitzvah. And we can also be really focused on one special mitzvah. This is something that's really unique for me. I'm extremely careful. I'm making sure this happens by hook or by crook. One way or another, I'll make sure that this gets done. This is important for me. We always have it. People reach out and they say, you know, Passover Seder for me is something I cannot miss. Or Yiskar by the synagogue is something I cannot miss. Everybody has their one uniqueness, something that they feel really connected to that specific mitzvah. Okay, beautiful. With that, we'll conclude. Thank you all for joining. And we hope to see you all again next week. Thank you. Yes, Laila Tov. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.